Welcome, everyone. It's so good to see everyone here uh, today with us, and uh, welcome everyone who's at home watching the live stream. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, please get them out and turn over to Genesis, the second chapter. We'll be there, Genesis 2, 3, 4, then uh, uh, into some Deuteronomy and ultimately into Galatians today. But let's start with Genesis. So as you're making your way there uh, in your Bibles, I'm not going to be putting verses up on the screen. I'm not as sophisticated as Mr. Kircheville. Uh, so we're just going to, this is going to be, have this one uh, slide up here, but uh, we'll just want you to look in your Bibles and follow along with me if you will. So today's lesson, what I want to do today is just kind of uh, connect with what Mark has been talking about the last several weeks, this idea of discipleship and following the master. And um, I, I just want you to understand that as you were hearing it in the audience, I was really hearing that most of that for the first time myself. I've seen some of these general principles, but not kind of worked out, fleshed out as Mark has done. So it was landing on me you know, newly, just as it was landing on you. And so I wanted to kind of share with you how I was kind of viewing these things through my, my perspective. And I wanted to try in some way demystify some of this a little bit um, as I listened to, to Mark's sermon, because this idea of discipleship can have some wonderful positive connotations to it because you're, you're mentoring, you're helping people along, but there could be some kind of uh, almost intimidating uh, aspects to this that, oh, am I trying to take someone's life and control it? Am I trying to take away their, their free will or free thought? Am I trying to kind of, you know, hunker them down and, and pin them down in some way? And so there's that kind of aspect. It can kind of be intimidating to think of that. So I wanted to, I never got that aspect of it because I'm viewing what Mark's saying through this biblical lens of what the biblical record is about how God viewed man. And so let's just start right out at the beginning in Genesis, shall we? In Genesis, uh, in, in fact, let me just uh, make sure I've got, oh, I got my notes all twisted here, so let me get to my first page. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, uh, here we go, uh, starting at verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So we're starting right at the beginning, right? The Lord planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and from there it divided and became four rivers. Let's stop right there. So what I want you to do is just try and picture the most idyllic garden setting, tropical setting that you've ever found yourself in. And this is where God has created man and placed him in this beautiful, idyllic setting. And he's told man, you'll see, you have the full run of this entire place. You, This is all for you. I've created this for you. I've put you in this idyllic setting. I have this very close relationship with you. But then, if you go down to um, verse 15, the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it, to keep it. Verse 16, the Lord commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. So God put man into this beautiful, idyllic setting, and he loves man so much, he, he, he respects man and, and loves his creation so much that he gives from the very beginning in the biblical record, man has to choose. He's going to either choose to serve God or he's going to choose to rebel against God. That's the two choices. God, though, as we will see, he longs for man to choose correctly. He tells man, I want you to choose life. Choose me. In me, there is life. Outside of me, there's death and destruction. But you must choose. You must choose. So God, in his, in his infinite wisdom, could have just superimposed upon man his will to where man could not have made any choice at all. But he respects man so much that he gives him the free will choice to choose are you going to choose life or are you going to choose death? 
Are you going to choose destruction? Are you going to choose to rebel? And so as Mark talks about discipleship, this is all what's, what's calibrating in my mind is that what we're, what we're trying to do for folks is give them a choice because the world is giving them a choice. And we're going to look at that next. Let's look in uh, the next chapter in Genesis chapter 3. Because this is pretty much an allegory of what the world offers us today. Look at this. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruits of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. Which was a, a lie and truth at the same time in some ways. When they ate of the, of the fruit, they didn't instantly die, but they brought death into themselves. So this is what the world offers us. For God knows that in the day they eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. This is very much the story of our life right now, is that the world says, you don't need God. You need what we're going to give you. We're going to give you things that look shiny, that feel good, that, that uh, are experiential, that are, are lovely, and may, they all may be. And that you don't need God, all you need is your personal goodness. And, and that's all you need. You don't need this, uh, this structure of religion and that type of thing. And so they're selling you what I would say is the ultimate fake news. Because they are telling you they are changing your eternal address to destruction rather than life. And God always wants us to choose life. Now ultimately, we see that Adam and Eve... They chose wrong and they're expelled from the garden. You see the same idea of choice in the next chapter with Cain and Abel. Go over to chapter 4. In verse 4, Abel on his part also brought of the first things of his flock, of their, of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So, be, so Cain became angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. So this is the essential tension of life, is that we are placed into a broken world, and the world is probably more broken now in my 61 years than I've ever seen it. I mean, it is, it's, it's a... We're in a real challenging environment in this country right now. And so we, people need God. They need God. The world's saying, no, you need us. You don't need God, right? And so this whole idea of, of Mark talking about discipleship is that we are trying to offer to people what God is saying he wants. We want to offer to them life. It's not that we want to control them. We want to supersede their will. We want to give them the gift of eternal salvation. That's what this is about. And so there's one other verse that I want to go to, and then I want to bring my brother Cork up. Um, because the point of this, the so what of this lesson is a couple of so what's. The first so what is God gives man the free will to choose. And we totally respect that. I love that. I love liberty. I love freedom. I bristle at anything that takes away freedom and liberty because of the biblical record. So that's off the table. There's no, it's not that we're trying to interfere in people's lives. We're trying to give people this gift of life to change their eternal address from destruction to eternity. And along the way, there's an abundant life that comes with this as well. Okay. Um, but I want to, the second so what, to keep this connection, so I want to bring Cork up here because this, these, these rhythms that, that Mark talks about, it's not some rote 
structured, step-by-step, I'm going to follow some checkbox thing and I'm going to get someone, I'm going to talk to them and it's going to happen this way. Folks, this is just being organically open and aware of what's happening in people's lives and just be opening your life up to them and minister to them where they're at. And it's different for everyone and Cork will make some of those points when we talk. Now I want to make one more verse before I bring him up here. And it's in Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. And I just love this verse because it is just uh, one of the essential messages of God to man. And it was really a rereading of the law of Moses to the children of Israel. But the principles apply to us. And it's how God views us, really. So if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, and starting at verse 10, Deuteronomy 30, starting verse 10. If you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, for this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it, for us to make it, us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you may observe it. I'm going to stop there just to make the point. The word is with us, folks. If you have brought, if Jesus Christ is your Savior and you have embraced that, you are that word. You are that word that you are making it accessible to people. It's not people in this world, in this broken world, are thinking, how do I even make my way through this? It's so far out of reach. The biblical record is so so mystifying to me that is it so far away? And and Moses is making the point, no, it's right. It's right here for you. It's right here for us today. We have the word. We have the message that we can bring life. We can bring functionality. We can bring goodness we can bring abundance of life to people because we have access to it. It's not some mystifying thing that we have to wait for some mystifying like God experience to talk to us in the middle of the night. It's right here. And that's the message from Deuteronomy. Now go on down and then let's just for time's sake, uh, I will read starting at verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death the blessing, the curse. So choose life in order that you may live in your descendants by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to you, fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give him, uh, and to give them. So that's a specific promise to them. But more the general theme is that God says, choose life, choose me. From the very beginning, from the garden, he said, Choose me. I'm going to give it. I'm giving you all this, this great blessing, but you've got to choose. You've got to make a choice. And, uh, and so that's our role in discipleship is bringing choice to people because the world is going to bring their choice. Believe me, the world's going to do exactly what Satan did in the garden. It's going to say, you don't need God. You just need more of life. You just need more stuff. And that's going to bring you happiness. And believe me, I've seen it in my short life time, 61 years, that there's a lot of, there's people in my circle of contacts that have great abundance, but they don't have great peace and happiness because the abundance of things, while it brings a lot of fun and it brings a lot of excitement and it brings some, some great memories and things, it doesn't, it's not fulfilling like having a relationship with your creator and knowing that your eternal address is not destruction, but it is life, okay? So having said that, I want to bring Cork Snyder up here because I want you to understand that this, this is, Cork is every man, and he really is. I mean, and he's going to say it right now, so I'm going to just bring him up here. And both Cork and I don't think, hey, we're not anything special, but we're just guys, right? So I'm going to grab a couple of these chairs. Yeah, I should, you, I should say that um, um, Dan and I are really good friends, so he, he knows a lot of my story. I'm a teacher. 
I've been teaching for 33 years. And if you're a teacher out there, you have just a million relationships and your whole life is built on relationships. And I've had a kind of a crazy career with some of these things. And the, uh, the last year has been so wild with some of the relationships coming and coming back. And of course, I've been talking to Dan about it. So believe me, I'm the one thing I would tell you is, uh, you know, I, Christianity is, is not easy for me. I know some people it's really easy for. I, I, I'm pretty flawed and I can be moody and I'm not always the best person to be around. But for whatever reason, I think it's incredible that God has used me in certain situations. And as I'll, I'll describe, some of these situations are like completely designed for me. And I, and I even realized like, whoa, I can't believe I can be used because I, like I said, I'm highly flawed. I have an incredible team my wife, if you know her, is just ridiculously poised. So anytime I struggle, when I, my ministry is I want results. And her ministry <laughs> is I'm a coach, you know, kind of thing. And my wife's whole idea is, you know, be patient. Don't worry about that. Let God do that. It's always, I mean, as long as I have her, I can do all these things. Because they're tough. These situations are, are really difficult to do. You know, and above her, I got my in-laws, which are, uh, to me, you know, the model of, you know, how you live your life. I can't do it like them, but, but it's nice to be able to see it. So I'm, I'm pretty, I have a pretty stacked lineup behind me. So that really it makes it pretty easy. So is that a good story? That's a this great This is not rehearsed. Yeah. No, no. And, and it's meant to be. <laughs> Can you tell it's unrehearsed? Yeah. No. It, uh, so uh, I think what I want you to share with them is maybe how some of these opportunities just kind of, and you don't have to be specific because, uh, you know, we don't have to be uh, careful of people's confidentiality, but how did some of these things kind of come to you and that you realize that, hey, you're the guy, right? And, and again, I think the point I want to make for you, the so what of you, is that if we're, if we're going to be successful at this, we need to, to just have open eyes and open ears and understand, are we the right person at the right time? Amen. You know, and I, I've had it where, where it just, I wasn't trying any way to be different than me. I just connected with someone and, and was just there for them. And it wasn't, I wasn't following any book or anything. It's just, I found an affinity for this person. They, they connected with me and, you know, we're able to really, you know, do some wonderful things. So go ahead. Um, well, what, one thing I would start with is uh, I'm, I'm a pretty good writer. I, I express this in writing well, which really comes in handy during the COVID era when all you can do is write to people. So that was something, a skill that I had. I think there's, there's three stories I want to tell you where one was, you guys know our uh, foster daughter, Ashley. She's in Oklahoma now. She's 30. She was a student of mine, and she lost her family, and my wife and I took her. But the story behind that is just remarkable. We weren't able to have a second child, and we decided, hey, let, let's, let's try to adopt. Well, during the adoption process for the county, you get your foster license. They kind of set it up that way. And then one day this counselor walks in and says, hey, you know, Ashley's been removed from her house. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Yeah. And um, I said, I called Sandy right then. I said, hey, Sandy, we got our foster license. Like, why don't we take her? So instead of getting a newborn, we got a 15-year-old. But it was just like, <laughs> it was just like perfect. It was like, it was so obvious. And the fact that my, the counselor was a Christian, he told me, um, when you walked in, I was just blown away. I sat there and he goes, what? I go, I think she's going to be in my house in the next couple of days. You know, and he's like, what? I go, it's a long story. So sometimes those things happen and you know that you're the guy. Now, has that been easy? No, it's not been easy. There's a lot of trauma involved with, you know, people that you're, I want results. I'm linear and trauma doesn't work linearly, you know, so it's very difficult, you know, <clears throat> so, and, you know, with Sandy there, and my daughter was incredible, she was five at the time, they're sisters, I mean, they, they communicate like, they are sisters, they communicate like that, and am I jealous of that, you know, kind of, I mean, it's so, um, the other one happened in 2010, and she has since contacted me about a month ago, she, um, this guy walks into my classroom, and I'm a bike rider, and this is significant in this story. It's the first day of school, and of course, I'm going to, you know, get out of there and go ride. And this guy walks in. I had never seen him before. I had never seen him since, and I don't remember his name. He walks in, and it's one of the, that passage where you never know if you're entertaining angels. I, I, really, I literally thought that. 
he walks in and he goes, are you Mr. Snyder? I said, yeah. And he goes, this is sort of talk about it. He goes, hold it together. I know. Hold goes, it together, man. And he goes, he goes, I know. It's yeah. better if I'm coaching a game. That's just so much easier than this. So, and he says, uh, do you know Christina? And I said, I, I do. Like, gives the last name. I don't give it here. I said, she goes, she really needs your help. I go, she needs my help. She goes, yeah. She says you could help her. She's probably 20 at this time. I said, okay. So I call her, and she's homeless. And she's, she dropped out of college. She's brilliant. And she's dropped out of college, and she's struggling. Her family life is a shambles. And, of course, I call Sandy. I said, what do you want me to do? She goes, just do what you think is right. So that night, she moves in. So she, she drove over to the house. It wasn't a hard movement when living out of your car. So she, she, she moves in. Well, that relationship was so interesting. She stayed there for six months. And she left um, just kind of abruptly. She, she didn't know what to do with us. She would tell me just a couple of weeks ago that, you know, we had stuck her, our hand out as far as we could. And I wasn't ready to grab it. She left because she kept bringing home animals to save. But one day she brought home four birds. And I'm like, you know, you can't just have birds in the house. And I'm, I'm remaining calm. And she's getting very animated. I can't let them. I go, like, oh, gosh, you know. So the next morning she moves out. Well, of course, 10 years later, She's a veterinarian, you know, which, of course, you know, just how God works. And when she called me, she, she said, I wanted to call you for years. I just didn't know what to say. I thought you'd be mad. Oh, well, I'm not mad. And then she told me she's getting married. And I said, great. You know, my, and my, um, my husband-to-be told me to call you. I said, okay, that's awesome. She goes, would you walk me down the aisle? I was like, I... That sounds easy as I don't have to wear a tie or anything. You know? <laughs> so these stories are incredible. And I asked her, what really helped you? And she said, you got me into biking. And I, all my troubles, I would just ride and ride and ride. And I thought, oh, my goodness. That guy showed up to my classroom while I'm in my bike outfit. And I took her riding twice a week. And I just couldn't believe that, like, have the specificity of the, of the job that God had for you. Because I never think I'm the right guy for these things. But when you look back, I thought, wow, I, I must have been because I'm such a you know, freak about bike riding. And then the, the other one is kind of playing out as we speak. This young, this, she's 40 now. This, this gal came back into my life. who's was just a great student. And she's got a lot of trauma. And I contacted her through Facebook. She had really dark posts. And I was just so alarmed by it. And all I'll tell you was... She's been involved in our, in our Bible study online, and she's really gotten connected, and she's really doing great, and Sandy hired her, so she's working now. A lot of trauma. She's got kids. The, the part where I'll tell you a couple things is, I, when I called her, I said, look, I just feel like God sent me to you. What do you need? And she says, I need hope. I was like, what? I can do that. I'm pretty hopeful. You know, so we, as we talked, you know, over time, um, she would later tell me, she goes, I don't think anybody could have got to me but you. And because, you know, you're, was, you're my favorite teacher and all this kind of stuff. And I thought to myself, without getting, getting into her issues, I thought, I think there's some truth to that. I hate to say it about myself, but I thought, wow. But you come away thinking, there are people designed for me to help. You know, because in general, I think I'm not the right person. I'll call Dan, Dan, you got to take care of this kind of thing, you know. <laughs> and believe me, the, the funny thing about the one that uh, you wanted hope is when she called me, I called Dan within probably an hour and said, look, I got a situation here. This is going to be huge. I just can, just can tell. I, I, the, the Cursivilles helped me. The Austins helped me. My in-laws. It was unbelievable the squad I put together. And when she came to Bible study and started talking about her life story, you just, I mean, the whole good thing we were on mute on Zoom because you was just, a, you know, everybody's just in tears. So, yeah, so all these stories are playing out. And I guess just what Dan wanted me to do and just to encourage you guys, you know, there are times when you know God's calling you. And those are three for me that it, it was clearly... It was me. I, I, I was the guy, and I accepted that. And they're not easy. It, it's really hard for me sometimes. You don't sleep sometimes at night because you have worries about them when there's emotion involved. It's not easy. But um, a couple things I would say, too, is you got to put together a good team because there's no way I can do something on my own. There's no way. And all the people that I, I've asked to help me, they have. And it's been remarkable. And then the first day of school, and Brooke will know this. I won't say the name, but... Um, 
I was talking to, to my a buddy, and he knows my whole story. First day of school, this teacher walks up to me, and she's a former student, and says, Cork, I need to talk to you. He said, what's up? She goes, I want to learn about Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm. I go, that's, so it's four former students in a very short period of time. It's, it's remarkable. Of course, I'm old, so this can happen more often. <laughs> I've done it for 32 years, yeah. but it's cool. So anyhow, that's Perfect. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Awesome. Is awesome. that it? That's it. Okay. All right, so the takeaways of this is, and Cork will be the first one to say it, Cork's just, he's, he's every man. He's just, he's just a guy. And what he's done in these interactions is he's just been open to being available to people's lives to help them along the way. And many times there was no, for the one person, it was a decade before he found out that his influence had been so transformational in this person's life. We don't know always. And the reality is, most people won't respond. The biblical record's clear on that in Matthew. Let's go here to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. The reality is, a lot of people just won't. This world is so enticing and so intoxicating that many just won't. And I'm just saying, don't be discouraged by the fact that you know your interactions with people might not seem like it's bearing any fruit, but just keep moving, just keep doing, keep being involved in people's lives because you don't know that you might get a phone call a decade from now if you're still on this earth saying, wow, that was transformational to me. And the last point I will make, and it really has to do with... Um, our Lord's Supper time is that when God, when God created man, and this goes back to a comment I made in class to, to Frank, I'm going to end with it here, is that when God created man, he gave him free will, knowing that man would choose wrong and that it would cost him his son. That's how much God respects free will and the ability to choose and freedom and liberty. That's how much he respects it. He knew that it would cost him his son, and he did it anyways. And so the abundant life that we have is um, found in John chapter 10. And Jesus talking to them, he says, Truly I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the field of the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. The world's a thief and a robber. It wants to rob you of your eternal salvation. It wants to trade your salvation for a shiny thing that is gonna rust and, 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 and just go away. But even as by the door is a shepherd of the sheep, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. We keep going down, so verse seven. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm telling you, we're out of time, but the Christian life is an abundant life. If you go over to Galatians 5, you're going to see the fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh, and you'll see what this life offers is a lot of frustration, pain, anger, and, uh, and, and the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. What beautiful characteristics to put into your life through the Holy Spirit. It brings so much goodness. It brings so much abundance. It's a blessing right here and now, but more importantly, it is changing your eternal address to be with your God. And that's what it's about. If you are here today and you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, your eternal address is not with him. Your eternal address is in destruction. That's, that is the message of the Bible. You need to take Jesus Christ on and have that abundant life. We, we offer that to you, and we offer that to you through our Bible classes, through our teaching, and through uh, you know, this opportunity right now. So I will say, 
that I cleaned up my backyard because I got an event next Saturday, so it's super clean. Well, there might be some dog stuff that we'll have to pick up, but we've got a warm working pool. I changed my pool service because they kept breaking my pool, but the pool is warm, ready to go for baptism. So if you're here today and you want to you know, make that confession to be baptized, we, we're, we're rocking and rolling over at the Buttery House right now. So um, let's end in a prayer. So pray with me. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this time to come together and really just, you know, open your word and, and understand some aspect of your character. We cannot fully comprehend your love and all that you are. And we talked about that in Neil's class today, that God, you, you're, you're so far beyond our human understanding, but we do understand certain aspects of your character, which is your love for the ability for us to have liberty and choice in this world. And you long so much for us to choose you over this life. And so we thank you for your word. We thank you for Cork's uh, testimony today and his ministry. We pray for each one of us in this audience and who's watching here. We know there's people doing all kinds of this type of work, that they're you know, just ministering to people, that we're not trying to do some sort of mechanical program. We're just trying to be loving and engaged and just give your message, the good message of the gospel. We thank you. We praise you. We pray all this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys have a great week in the Lord. Thank you.